Welcome back to another episode of the King's Pulse podcast. My name is Brendan Nunez. Got Hunter Patterson of The Athletic joining me today as always. What's going on, Hunter? You good, man? Nothing much. All is well. I know a lot of people might be conflicted about the A's being in sack, but um, I'm still on my solid team vibes, so I had to throw the hat on. Yeah, you know, I debated going with the A's hat. We do kind of have to, like, not coordinate, but make sure. And Chris Watkins, too, has an A's hat. A lot of us have A's hats. That's not weird. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've showed up to a practice wearing the same hat before, and it's like, all right, maybe we need to figure this out or how this is going. I show up to the to the station and Chris is wearing the same stuff. And I'm like, gosh, damn. All right. So anyways, thoughts with A's fans right now, definitely just announced that they will be spending three, potentially four years in Sacramento after this season. I know there's strong feelings about it. Um, yeah, I guess my two cents for what it's worth. Let's get them. Nobody asked or gives a shit. As a dude that watches no baseball at all, except I've watched the last Giants series. I just watched the whole series they played against the Dodgers. That's, right. and that's the most baseball I've watched since the Giants won championships in early 2010s. Not going to lie. Um, so I'm personally excited that there's going to be a professional league team right here, even if you know, there's all the shit that comes with the A's. Now, I feel for fans in Oakland and Bay Area fans that feel a type of way about their team leaving. I get that. Um, I do think there's an aspect of this could be good for the city of Sacramento. Definitely could. I'm more on on the along the lines of kind of just feeling bad for Oakland. Like you lose the Warriors, the, um, the Raiders are in Vegas now. So I could feel kind of I could I could understand the animosity, but at least they'll be in SAC, which is like hour, hour and a half drive as opposed to like Vegas, where you'd have to catch a flight. So hopefully. A's fans from Oakland will be able to make the trek out here and enjoy some games. But as I said, sell the team. Let's just get it over with and keep the A's in, in Oakland. I agree. I agree. I think there's hope from Vivek that maybe the A's could end up staying in SAC, or maybe this is yeah. a trial run to prove that Sacramento can handle a professional MLB team. Now, I don't think that Sutter Health is necessarily the most well-equipped. I, I had heard some rumors earlier the last like month or so that originally that place was built with a foundation that was made to be able to be built upon if that makes sense okay. and expanded um but when it was i guess this is the again rumor that right. while that during the building process they kind of had to fast track things and didn't get to quite implement all that stuff that they necessarily wanted to so could be potentially a lot of reworks that would need to be done at Sutter health i'm curious to see what they do i don't know if you've been out there there's like that grass patch in pretty much most of the outfield where people just kind of go sit. It feels like a minor league experience, you know, which is cool. Oh. When you got a pro team, though, it's a little different. Interested to see kind of how they go with standings and all that in the uh, in the outfield. But the current professional team in Sacramento, the Sacramento Kings, Great are, work. you know, trying. I see you. Doing all right post All Star break, and the big news is obviously Kevin Herder has been down for a while. It was just announced yesterday that he had surgery and will be out for the remainder of the season, which includes postseason, obviously. But he's expected to be fully healthy for the start of next year. TBD if that's going to be in a Kings uniform or not, but that's a different conversation. And in the meantime, Malik Monk has gone down, and this was on March 29th. He Luca sort of fell on his leg. I saw some Kings fans not very happy with Luca for it. I didn't think there was anything to it. Neither Does he did try I. to sell contacts sometimes? Sure. It didn't have any, like, I didn't feel a type of way about it at all. Right. But Malik, MCL sprain, reevaluated in four weeks, which would be the ninth. I'm sorry, the 26th, I believe. Let me make sure this is right. Yeah, 26th of March. And for reference, we have seven games left in the regular season for the Sacramento Kings. The 14th is the last regular season game. So 12 days removed from that is like the earliest reevaluation. And I will say in the Kings press release, it says four weeks when your coworker Shams put it out, it said four to six weeks. 
And, you know, my initial thought with that is Sacramento, of course, the team itself would rather they'd want their fan base to think that, you know, it's probably going to be on the lower end Definitely. sort of thing. Um, but I think that four to six is, you know, our, I'm not expecting to see Malik again unless the Kings make it to the second round or something. And even maybe then this guy's in a contract year. If you're his agent, I feel like you have to be telling him, you know, don't risk re-injuring yourself right as you're about to get a bag. Yeah. I, I mean, if I were him, I definitely err on the side of caution. He's proved himself enough. This is the best season of his career. He's due for a good chunk of money more than he's probably ever made in his career. So I wouldn't really risk re-injuring that, that MCL or like potentially something else because you're compensating for an injured knee at the time. So if I were Malik, I would kind of kick my feet up literally and figuratively and enjoy the the rest of the season as kind of like the hype man we saw he was uh, a couple of nights ago. Yeah, with that Keegan Dunk, uh, Kings just beat the Clippers. We are recording this before the Knicks and Celtics back-to-back, but we're going to keep it evergreen enough that uh still be relevant after the fact. I mean, I think since Malik has gone down, this has been a – like they just have to function differently. The second sure. unit – uh I mean, this is a guy that's probably going to win six man of the year. He seems like the favorite. Nas Reed making a push. I'm curious to see if his starting performances like impact mm. his six man of the year stuff. Kind of a weird situation there. Um, but it really feels like it's kind of those two, at least in my mind. Um, and you can't run as much pick and roll, <clears throat> excuse me, in that second unit. And I think the Don Fox lineups are what get really interesting because Malik or Domas will be out there. They'll stagger Demonis Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox. Very, very rare. Most games, there's not going to be any minutes where neither of those guys are on the floor. Maybe one possession at the end of a quarter or something like that. Um, but typically, De'Aaron comes out, Malik comes right in. And that's part of why he's such a – that's why they have him in that six-man role, so you always have that perimeter playmaker. But Keon Ellis has stepped into that starting spot, and what do you think are kind of the keys to, with Malik out, what needs to what needs to change or who needs to step up? I think it'll be a by-committee type situation for the second unit. And obviously Malik, you can't replace everything that he does with his playmaking, his ability to score. He's – Arguably outside of Fox, one of the best one-on-one -on -one players on the team, whether in the first or second unit. So you're not really going to be able to replace him with one person. But I think Davion, over these past two months, not counting April, is having the best two-month shooting period of his career. He was about 44.7% from three in February and March. And that is, I don't want to say by far, but that's – comfortably the best he's ever shot the ball he's in the good. league he's yeah good. over two months and so aside from trusting your work as Davion usually does um I think him being a threat from the three-point line opens the floor up for the rest of the second unit because on scouting reports in the past he hasn't really been too much of a threat so guys kind of sag off him a little bit and that packs the paint but when Davion is willingly and actively looking for his jumper and knocking it down at a high rate, people have to respect him. They, he brings guards out of the paint. And he's also really quick, which he, he uses to his advantage more now than in the past. So incoming spray three comment, but for him, he'll be able to touch the paint pretty often, blow by his defenders once he's got the jumper rolling. And then be able to kick out to teammates and hopefully create better looks. So that's one way you can try to compensate for Malik. But obviously also having Sasha and Trey back, that really helps stretch the floor to two of probably the most consistent three-point threats on the team for the Kings. So very much a by-committee type situation. Yeah, I guess the next man up mentality. You checked a lot of post press conference or post game press conference boxes there. You know, you got spray threes, man. you got paint touches, uh, next man up mentality. Yeah. You know, we all got the coach speak going on when he's, we hear it enough, right? No, he's, I was about to say, he's not just impacting the players. I might, I might throw a spray three out in random conversation from here, <laughs> hearing from time to time. So, be at 24 like we're not getting enough sprays <laughs> yeah bro. <laughs> what is going every on time we, every get time we got to touch the paint kick it out yeah snap drive snap drive oh yeah um 
I, I think we need to have a quick conversation about Davion because you've been about it. You've been uh, a big Davion guy. Mm -hmm. And I was on the other end. I was very skeptical at the time they drafted him. I wish my buddy got my reaction. I've never been more shocked, I think, at a draft pick, to be honest, because they already had. I thought they were going Moody, who went right after. I liked Moody. I liked Zaire Williams. I honestly kind of liked Book Knight, too, because he was falling in that Mm -hmm. draft. And, you know. I'll I'll take the L on that one. But I will then, say though, with with him, his situation possibly could have been different if he hadn't been in Charlotte. Potentially, potentially, yeah. yeah. And that's a yeah. Actually, we'll get to that. Jordy Fernandez potentially getting mm-hmm. interviewed for that one. And I also liked Jalen Johnson and Zaire Williams. So you know, some yeah. hits, some misses, I guess we'll say. But it was more so that it was like it was already De'Aaron. It was Tyrese also, and they went and got Davion. So I was like, okay, what the hell is this? And I right. think those guys ended up playing like. 60 something minutes together in their entire career, all sharing the floor, all three at the same time. Mm-hmm. Davion has kind of been in a weird spot because of that. You know, year one, it's okay, how am I going to fit around these guys halfway through the season? Or sorry, halfway through his, yeah, his rookie season, yep. I believe it is. Tyrese gets traded. And then it's an entire new system. This dribble handoff game is nothing close to what he did at Baylor. You know, he's the guy that's breaking guys down off the dribble where I want to say LeBron or Dame or somebody was joking and tweeting out that this looks like Donovan Mitchell watching him at Baylor, you know, and they got the same last name. They got the number 45 out there. I want to say it was Dame. It might have been Dame, Um, but it's a whole different style. And the three point shooting was a question mark, right? It was something he did really good his senior year. Not very good in any other seasons. And now he just looks comfortable. I don't know how to say it more than that. Like he he looks accustomed to his role in this offense and he looks aggressive. Like it, I kind of go back to that Minnesota game that they played on the road without Fox where mm-hmm. Keon started, but Mike shared, Mike Brown shared that they really asked Avion to be more aggressive in that game. The paint touches that you mentioned, how quick he is off the dribble, the deceleration, he could he can break some guys down. Like he oh, yeah. almost dropped somebody in that last game, if I'm remembering right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, since the start of the year, 41 games, 15 minutes, 51% from the field, 42% from three on two a game. Like this is a guy that, you know, we talk about bigs taking a while, point guards taking a while. Sometimes it's a guy in his third year, you know, yeah. and sure he's 25 drafted a little older, but I don't know. What is this recent run do for your long-term projection of Davion? I think you mentioned just the adjustment that it it takes when he's primarily breaking guys down and then he has to get adjusted to a new system with Mike and the DHOs and he I don't want to say he's just starting to get comfortable in that situation but I think the encouragement he has from coaches players and knowing that Malik, I don't want to say is coming to save the second unit, but he's not out there to do what he usually does. And in Malik being the primary ball hander in that second unit, I think Davion possibly could have lost his edge a bit. And now he realizes like, okay, I have to kind of be one of those guys to look for my offense. And if he doesn't, he's almost doing the team a disservice because like we talked about earlier, he's not demanding that the opposing team is really defending him and that makes life tougher for all of his teammates so i think he's turned a corner a bit i know during the second half of his rookie season i believe De'Aaron was out for a bit and he was getting a start and he that was the best basketball he's played in a king's uniform since being in the league so it's not necessarily that version of Davion where he's ultra aggressive. I remember he was averaging a good amount of assists at that time. And again, you have Domas, so it's a completely different team than it was his rookie season. But altogether, I think since Domas has been here, since Mike has been here, this is the most aggressive I've seen Davion. And I, I think Obviously, you would have liked to see that come earlier on, but for this to be brewing right before the playoffs and play-in situation, that could pay dividends for the team. 
It's definitely at a time where they need him. And yeah. is it after year three that you're extension eligible? I think it is, right? Because after year yeah. four, you go into restricted. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Davion's at that point, you know, and I hate to go straight to this because a good Davion Mitchell is still very impactful for the Kings. Right. But we know the thought this offseason is what's the next big swing the Kings are going to take. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much going to be in the form of a trade. Most deals, draft capital is a big part of this, but yeah. there's also like typically one young player in there or like guy that has potential mm-hmm. that is also a selling piece. Like Harris Barnes, Kevin Hurd are the likely matching salaries, one of the two. And right. then it's like, okay, Keegan Murray probably not going to be involved unless we're talking about somebody ridiculous. Can't, Davion's can't in there. No, unless it's something crazy. Davion's really the one you look at. Mm -hmm. And so it's helpful for the Kings right now, but I think it's also extremely helpful for the Kings this off season Mm -hmm. for the potential value that Davion has. And I I think that also like, this is kind of the silver linings that come with Malik going down, right? Like the Kings are a better team of Malik Monk, but sometimes injuries happen and other guys get more opportunity, expand their game. And then when Malik comes back, say that he does return next year and Davion has took a step and, Keegan's the other one I want to get to say these guys have taken a step. They can still be better players as Malik returns. And Mm -hmm. so those are the two that I'm really looking at it. And Keegan being the other one, they've talked about wanting Keegan to play make a little bit more. And it's funny. We first heard that after the Utah game and he had three assists in that game. And he's talking about playmaking more, but I think it's just the idea of not always looking to score, right? It's, De'Aaron kicking to him and now I'm going to take two dribbles and if this shot's not here it's probably going to be like you know this weird reverse pivot back into a pass where the offensive flow is kind of just <laughs> ruined you right. know so I, I think it's more about maintaining that flow taking two dribbles and if it's not there kicking it right away or even just driving for the sake of kicking and so I, I think there has been progress there but I, I really think that if Malik going down is what it takes for yeah, I shouldn't word it like that. I know what you mean. Keegan averaging 20 to close this season would be one of the best things that could happen to the Kings. Without a doubt. And back-to-back games at this point for him with 18 shot attempts, which is the most – or, well, not the most, because after the Utah game, he had, like, 23 shot attempts, and then he had, like, 17 after that. So that was the biggest two-game stretch, but – this is the first time he's had at least 18 attempts in back-to-back games, and he's averaging 22 and a half. He's just looking way more aggressive than he had in the past. And I think he also feels, I don't want to say the burden, but he understands that with Malik not being around to create shots and bolster the offense is on him a little bit now. And, like you said, the wording of it might be a little shaky. Like you don't want Malik going down to be the reason that Keegan is right. blossoming a little bit, but you can tell he's starting to look for his shot. He's feeling more comfortable in that. And the more he's willing to break guys down off the dribble, I think the floor opens up for him to be able to kick to the corner or find a big in a dunker spot and he's tried a couple times some of them have turned into turnovers unfortunately for him but you can see that he's kind of progressing as a playmaker he's trying to continue expanding his game and another random thing about Keegan's game that I'm starting to really like is when guys run out at him at the three-point line he takes like a couple dribbles and then there's that like one-legged floater that he'll do he's there's just very obviously certain parts of his game that are developing this season that weren't there at all last year. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely encouraging. And then you mentioned kind of Trey Lyle, Sasha Vizenkov coming back. It's funny how that happens. The same game that is the first one Malik Monk is unavailable for. So we go from all these three guard lineups that we're seeing Sacramento roll out to all of a sudden, like Keegan Murray's playing the two next right. to Trey Lyles and Sasha Vizenkov and Alex Leonard, Amanda Sabonis, and you're like, what is going on out here? All of a sudden, there's a bunch of size. Um, and Keon Ellis, in that starting lineup, who's done pretty well, they've now logged 165 minutes with that five-man group, 
104.2 defensive rating. Offensive is okay at 112.5, uh, giving you about a plus eight net rating there. So solid in those minutes. And I don't feel like there's much else to add about Keon. I feel like we've kind of touched on him in the last episodes. And like at this point, I think we kind of know who he is. In yeah. a way, he still can be a little foul prone at times, but a disruptive defender who's a good shooter. Um, how, how are you feeling about how he's slid into that starting lineup? And is there anything you've noticed as that's kind of continued? He's someone who we still don't really have a feel for offensively. And I forgot who asked Mike. It may have been Slater, actually. It was. Yeah. yeah, he asked Mike pregame what he thought. Keon ceiling could be offensively and Mike admittedly was like he's still so raw and so young like we don't really know yet and over one of these games during the home stretch he he had double digit points he I want to say had about seven in the first quarter and most of that comes from threes and catch and shoot threes but um, I think he's he's still a work in progress, obviously, and someone who can continue to develop offensively. I don't know if he'll ever be necessarily the three point shooter Kevin Herter is in his prime and and when he's rolling, but I think he just brings different things, obviously, than Kevin does. And because of that, the the overall offensive and defensive aggressiveness of the starting unit is a bit different. But um, you know that you're never going to have to worry about Keon's effort. You know he's going to give 110% every time down. And it's it's cool to watch just as a basketball fan, kind of seeing him put the pieces together and each game kind of seemingly be more confident in himself. Yeah, he's playing well. I mean, he definitely deserves the uh, main roster spot that they ended up promoting him to this year. And also shout out, Lindsey Harding, who just won G League Coach of the Year, worked really closely with Keon last year when he was in SAC. I know Keon was really excited to potentially play for Lindsey in Stockton, and then Lindsey kind of joked yesterday when we talked to her that, like, Keon who? He hasn't been here yeah. all year, you know, um, which is a credit to Keon and and Sacramento's developmental system, and, and happy for Lindsey. They got a playoff game tonight, actually, single elimination that I'll be out there at, so rooting for them, but the Kings have kind of changed their identity recently, you know, in, in a way, and they've been forced to, but this whole year they've been about playing fast, physical and together. And that still exists, mm -hmm. but post all-star break, it's really been, it, it seems like they've leaned into that defense and the physicality really in the, in the month of March, you know, where in that month they actually ended up seventh and defensive rating they've held a handful of teams under 100 and these are solid offensive teams they're being physical sometimes that's leading to them fouling a good bit but i think right. that mike's okay with living with that and would rather rather have to rein it down than try to you know pull it out of these guys so the fast physical and together still exists but now it's about okay how can we survive defensively pretty much or how can we be physical defensively and really defending the three Mm -hmm. and winning the possession game. Um, Mike has kind of said that's their big formula recently. And, like, for example, for for people that are wondering exactly what the possession game is, like, sure, you could just look at straight-up field goal attempts on a night. That will give you a decent idea, but really where it comes from, using this Clippers game as an example where the Kings just killed the Clippers in the possession game is offensive rebounds uh, is one of them. Get another opportunity. Sacramento had 20 to the Clippers nine. So you get an advantage there. Free throw attempts is going to be one of them. The Clippers had 27 Sacramento had 25. So slight advantage to the Clippers there. And the other one is going to be uh, turnovers where Sacramento had 10 compared to the Clippers 16. So I think taking care of the ball is a big thing. You know, you see in some of these losses, it feels like pretty often in a bad loss, either Domas had a lot of turnovers or De'Aaron had a lot of turnovers. Those two guys taking care of the ball is pretty big. Um, but what have you made of like the Kings are able to now win a game against the Clippers when they shoot 28% from three? What what have you made of what's led to some of these defensive improvements and how much do you buy it? 
first, I'll say off the rip, I'm starting to buy it. I, I would put a little bit of stock in that because obviously you're not going to be scoring 130, 120 every game during the postseason. And there's been talk, obviously, about the way the refs are kind of starting to let teams play and more physicality and different things like that. So that's playing into the Kings benefit. But I think Keon is a huge reason for that. I, I don't I don't want to obviously disrespect Kev because his his game, I think, defensively has come along a good amount before he got injured this season. And he was probably more bought in than he was last season in trying to be aware of like, okay, if the shot's not falling, I'm at least going to be on the boards. I'm trying my best to play defense. But Keon, that just kind of comes naturally to him. And sometimes I think he can be the catalyst for why guys want to play hard defensively. It's like I'm on a max contract. I see someone who just got converted from a two-way. He's busting his ass every single possession. Why shouldn't I be doing the same? And Keon sometimes can really set a good precedent for the rest of the game in certain things he does early on, whether it's a couple deflections in one possession, whether it's getting a block on someone who's much taller than him since he's not really ever the biggest guy on the floor. He gets on the floor often. He's diving for loose balls. So I think just being a competitive person and seeing the way Keon approaches defense can kind of elevate the guys around him, which is a huge credit to him only being in his second season. And at this point, they they all look bought in. There was a possession with the second unit. De'Aaron was out there, but it was mainly Alex. Trey was out there. I want to say Davion possibly too, but I've never seen Alex Lynn close out to the three-point line and recover and, and – um, jump up straight and down get pretty good verticality and not foul anyone in the process and not like jump at a closeout and end up on the bench basically because he's out of the play at that point so i think every that that to me was a possession where you could clearly see guys are extremely bought in defensively i don't know if it's the season is ending there's only a handful of games left Maybe they're tired of hearing Mike talk about closeouts. Whatever the case may be, the team just looks more bought in than ever defensively right now. So because of that and because of the way Keon, I think, can inspire guys to play harder, I'm I'm buying it. They're on a string for sure. And Mike has said and some of the other guys have said things that make you believe it, too, that they are enjoying playing defense and like taking some pride in it now. And I think it is starting to become something that they feel like this is just what we do. And I think what you mentioned about Keon is definitely big. Like the Aaron was always talked about is being one of the big X factors defensively because he's the head of the snake, right? The guy guarding point of attack. Now Keon is usually starting like that. Yeah. And so he's the one setting the tone and everybody else kind of follows his footsteps. And so I think that that has definitely played a part. And, and some of these other guys are bought in too. You mentioned Alex, a uh, really big game against the Clippers. I think three blocks, seven rebounds. Uh, won the defense player of the game crown. He's oh, yeah. does a good job staying ready, and people love Alex. I will say I think the downside is the the fouls is probably what Mike points at and what you mentioned there as well of you know moments where he's getting better about that at times. I don't know what to I, – I believe in the defense, mm-hmm. at least that it's better than like the 25th they were at last year, right? I think we're talking like somewhere around middle of the pack. Easily. What about the offense now? Like more defense is is specifically when it comes to forcing turnovers in that possession game that we're talking about. If you're getting offensive rebounds, if you're forcing turnovers and scoring off of it, if you're getting to the free throw line more than your opponents, like all that is little detail stuff. That's more defensive oriented. I think that helps your offense. It's why the Knicks are, like the ugliest offense you've ever watched in your life, but really damn efficient for the last couple of years because they take care of all these gross little details. Now, I think that helps, but the Kings have kind of struggled to score since Kevin went down and really since Malik went down as well. Mm -hmm. And you reach the postseason, how much responsibility is about to be on De'Aaron Fox? 
I was just getting ready to bring him up. As as much as I love the Aaron's game and as dynamic as I think he is, he hasn't shot above 50% since March 20th when they were in Toronto. And even then it was eight for 15, so it was 53%. All love to everybody in Toronto and the Raptors and everything, but <laughs> it's the Raptors at the end of the day. And I think potentially because Keon doesn't have as much um, velocity as, as coach likes to call it, when he's coming off DHOs, he's not necessarily pulling guys away from De'Aaron. Teams possibly can focus more on De'Aaron and try to make his life harder. So I, I think we've seen it in real time. He was six for 20 last game. He had a nine for 22 in the second Mavericks game, six for 18 in the first. So because life has become harder for him, I've seen him a decent amount of times over these last few games kind of bail the defense out, I would say, and just jack up a three when he himself might not even be that confident in it. So the more I think he's getting to the basket, putting pressure on on defenders at the rim, that can possibly free his, his offensive game up. But yeah, right now he's he's I don't want to call it a rough patch because they're they're winning games, but I, I would want to see more from him offensively. I think they kind of need it. And yeah. it, it's harder on him out there now, too. Like without Kevin and Malik, the spacing is way different. Those are the two guys that probably played the best with Domas in a two man game. They just get the most reps. A lot of De'Aaron's minutes come without Domas. Um, yeah. Not a lot, but a decent bit, you know, compared to some of those other guys. And so. I just think they're going to be relying on him a lot. And I do think he's been settling a little bit. Like you mentioned, some of his percentages are not great as of late, but it's kind of what they need. And that's really where we're going to be in the postseason. I think it's got to go him and then Keegan. And like, I don't know. Is it is it weird that like Domas is a guy that we're talking about just got close to max money and this is where I've always felt weird and understood the Domas I guess haters, people that question him, whatever you want to say, right? Is that this is a guy that got paid for his offense Mm -hmm. and we're sitting here talking about, okay, where is Sacramento going to score? And after De'Aaron, my mind doesn't go to the other Max guy that's getting paid for his offense. Now Domas, I know makes players better. And I think he's best used when those other players are already really damn good. And he's just taking them to that next level, you mm-hmm. know, but I don't know. Should I be putting Domas in that conversation of like, no, they need him to go and score in the postseason too. I personally don't just because Domas's game is more predicated on. Like you said, elevating the guys around him, DHOs, but I don't really look at Domas as someone who I can trust for a seven game series to give him the ball and say, okay, you go get a bucket on your own. And that's not what what he's in sack to do. That's not really his role. But I also am not really confident in that ever being his role. I think he's, as far as scoring goes, I think he's a bit limited. But offensively as a whole, he's really talented because of the way he sees the game. I think he's probably one of the smartest guys definitely on the Kings and potentially in the league, just about the the passes that he sees before they're even there. But who I do have full faith in is De'Aaron. And this, this um, kind of, I don't even want to call it like a, a rut. I, I don't want to call it that. But this stage he's in right now where he's not shooting as efficiently doesn't really bother me because I've seen him do what he did against the Warriors with a fractured finger and be the guy who, hey, we need a bucket. It's on you. And he's like, cool, I got it. So I I believe in him to find his rhythm and potentially by the time the play in playoffs, wherever they end up, that start to be healthy and in a position where he's ready to attack 
the basket as much as possible. So I, I have full faith in De'Aaron. To summarize, I'm not really trusting Domas to go get a bucket, but I do trust him to facilitate, to find other guys to get buckets, and ultimately elevate the offense without having to score. Yeah, I think that really, and this I was already at this point before Malik went down for what it's worth, but I think the way the Kings win a postseason series is if De'Aaron is the most productive player on the floor. And like he almost was, if he doesn't hurt his finger, I think he probably was more effective than Curry in that series. Yeah. Now those are both the stars, but like if he's playing on the caliber of Curry in, in a postseason last year and the last three and a half games or so, he's playing with a broken finger. Like I, I have faith in him to be that guy. I will say my thing with Domas and not saying he's not worth the money or anything. I think that he's a great guy and he's obviously done so much for changing the trajectory of Sacramento. Yeah. Um, what has been my recent like tick, I guess, or agitation with Domas mm -hmm. specifically with that scoring is that I feel like he takes forever to make his move. I feel like he could catch with a smaller guy on him and you're still going to get like three dribbles. It's almost like he's taking a pound dribble and then looking and being like, okay, where's this double about to come from? Because yeah. he's really just taking that dribble to try to pass, right? But then he takes like three and then will pump fake, do some reverse pivot, and then pivot again, and then finally shoot it. <laughs> Might miss the first one. And when he gets it back, pump fake again, and then go back up. And it's like, I just don't feel like it's very often that he's catching the ball low on a mismatch. It, it, there's mismatches where he's getting pushed out a little bit, catching a little further than I think he maybe should. And like, I don't know, maybe I just, uh, the last episode I'm talking about, he never does fake triple handoffs. And now I'm watching for it and he does a little bit here and there, you know? So right. maybe I'm not noticing all these tiny little things, but I feel like it's very rare that he catches and instantly goes into his move. So that's been my one little thing for Domas recently. I would say he's not really as decisive as you would want him to be, but he's he's just more thought out and methodical about how he approaches offense. But again, like you said, for someone making max money and as much as he is, you would want him to be a bit more decisive and willing to break guys down off the dribble because he's strong as hell. Most nights I would say he's probably the strongest person out there. And he just – Possibly because of the amount of strength he has, he lacks elusiveness. So it's some of his stuff can kind of be predictable. It's just, I'm going to overpower you. I'm going to throw something up. And if I don't make it, I'm going to get the rebound, pump fake a bunch of times and try to possibly like bait you into a foul. And then even then, as much as I love what he brings to the game offensively, I don't trust him a ton from the free throw line either. So, um, yeah, man, Domas, we believe in you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's the big takeaway here. That's the takeaway. And we're talking about Keegan needs to be better. Domas is what helps make Keegan better, mm -hmm. you know, and same with all these other guys, but really Domas is the key. And so for me, it's like De'Aaron needs to be a superstar. Yeah. And when we're talking postseason, I need to see Keegan take another jump. And after that, it's like, can I get 30? I mean, probably more actually from the combination of Davion, Harrison, Trey, and Sasha. Mm -hmm. You know, like those guys are what are we going to get from them tonight? And I think I think that Keon's the same. I actually think that I, I almost want to say that Davion should be the one that is like the one that you feel like you can rely on at this point. Yeah. I, at least I, from an aggressiveness standpoint. I agree. And then even even HB, he's just so I mean, his role calls for this a little bit like it's not really ever going to be his night every single night. But I mean, last game against Dallas, he had 20 Utah. He had 24. He was really hot in that third quarter, I want to say. And then he has six points on seven shots against the Clippers. So this dude makes no sense, bro. I, I know. Don't understand Harrison. I, I love the fact that he's as adaptable as he is from game to game. He knows, like, not every night is going to be my night. But I would also like to rely on him a bit more as one of the older vets, one of the guys who's had the most playoff experience probably on the team outside of JaVale. But 
he's someone who you would like to be able to go into the postseason trusting and knowing like, okay, we're going to get the aggressive version of HB every night. And maybe that's in the works. Maybe that's like loading up right now, but I don't necessarily feel that level of confidence in him just yet. I don't know that I do either. It makes it makes no sense, man. You mentioned 20 in da- against Dallas, 24 against Utah. I think he had 16 in the third or 14, something like that in that third off, yeah. we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and then six against the Clippers, and he didn't play much in this game in the first half specifically because James Harden was trying to go at him in switches. And yeah. same with Paul George. And those guys found some success. And, you know, I'm not exactly expecting HB to – Certainly not guard James Harden. Now, PG is a guy you'd like to be able to put him on. If Kawhi yeah. is out there, he's probably the one on Kawhi, which I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Sometimes I'm like, wow, you just got blown by in the easiest way possible. And then other nights, it's like you face the Lakers, and he's on Braun. And at the end of the night, I'm like, man, that wasn't bad. Yeah. You know, I just – he's so confusing to me. He's so confusing. But one thing we know we can't count on him for is that – uh that D cell Euro or that D cell. Oh yeah. Like I'm gonna let you jump by me while I'm still on this one leg. And then I'm gonna go up and get fouled or just get a bucket. So, so I, I confirmed the other day, you really can stay on that one leg as long as the other one doesn't come down forever. There is. Did you see that one clip going around in the G league guy? No, I'm gonna send it to you, but there's a dude who does the HB thing. Just like extremely <laughs> exaggerated. And he like proves your point in what you just said. Cause he stays there. Like until HB usually waits until somebody gets airborne, but this dude right. will wait until the defender is like in the air, lands, and then I'm gonna get my shot off. But <laughs> yeah, you can stay there as long as you want. Yeah, there's yeah for people listening, it's like say it's a right to left euro. HB goes right and then left, and the right leg is still in the air while the left is planted, and he never puts that right leg down. And you could stay there as long as you want. Really, as long as you don't plant that right leg again, and HB does that really well. There's also just because you mentioned this, there's this G League dude. Um, I'm forgetting his name. Watched him in summer league last year. I think he was on Orlando summer league last year. The hook know, shots, yep. the hook shots. And he's like a six two guard yeah. doing these hook shots. I was like, dude, I love this. I love Me this. He's bringing it back. What do you want to see? Seven games left in the regular season for the Kings. What? are you watching for the most as the postseason gets close here with the Kings really in a, in a tight race, by the way, real quick in the standings update, they're eighth, half a game behind seven, actually half a game behind six and a full game behind five, still very much in this. Also one game above of the nine spot, every single game, every night really with how much teams are playing and how many teams are in this Western race that we're talking about. Really, you could go five to nine, 10 is still all realistic outcomes for the Kings at this point in the season. But what are you looking at or looking for in these final seven? I would like the defense to stay where it's at and the offense to get back on track to what it was earlier in the season. And if you take the loss to Dallas on the first night of that, it wasn't a back-to-back, but the first night that they both played here in SAC, None of their opponents have scored over 110 other than the overtime win that they had against Memphis. So if you can if you can maintain that level of consistency defensively, you're leaning into the physicality because, you know, the refs are kind of letting a little bit more go than they did earlier on in the season, while also still winning possession battles, still being able to attack mismatches in certain situations and hopefully not shoot 12 of, I think, 42 from three like they did last game, then that's a real recipe for winning, in my opinion. And hopefully in that process of finding the offense, De'Aaron finds more rhythm and and more more efficiency in his shot attempts. But for me, first and foremost is keeping the defense where it's at and in doing that, hopefully you turn defense into offense and bolster the kind of lackluster offense that they have currently. But I don't really worry that much about the offense. I think between De'Aaron, HB's random hot nights, you get, 
I'm struggling a little bit from here, but Keegan can have his nights as well. I think they have enough to still really be a good offensive team without Kevin, without Malik. And the more Trey and Sasha and those guys off the bench kind of get more integrated into the offense. Yeah, I think you nailed it. I'm definitely with you. I think the defense is definitely something I'm looking for. There's going to be some good physicality tests. I Mm -hmm. think as this gets closer, the Knicks really be in the one. Yeah. Knicks are as physical as it gets. And even when you go to Boston, Boston in Boston, by the way, the Kings get smacked every year. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it. Uh, Boston's at a point. Because you like Boston. I I did. Well, it's actually really tough for me because then everybody hits me up of like, oh, you must be happy. And I'm like, honestly, I've not watched that many Celtics games this year. So not really. I feel you. Um, it's, it just doesn't hit the same since they traded Marcus Smart. I'm not going to lie. Because mm. that was so much of the Celtics to me. Yeah. He so. was like, as much as obviously JT, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are like the guys, he was like the Celtic. Yeah. It, it, was, it was him, Al and Jalen Brown that were like the trio for me. Mm-hmm. And and then Tatum was there as well, but really it was like the IT team that I loved. Oh my so God, it's, yeah. Classic. You know, a little, just barely, barely before Tatum. Even Rozier cooking for your heat mm. right now. I'm a big Terry. I'm a, I got a scary Terry t-shirt somewhere over there from when he dropped Eric Bledsoe in the first game of yeah. first round against the, against the Bucks. That was a great series. Um but good tests for the Kings on this run for sure. And I'm with you. I, I think that ideally I'd like to add Harrison to the list of guys that you want to see step up. I just don't. I can't. I can't. I, I don't feel comfortable relying on him. And whatever you get is a plus. I'm really looking at how much can you survive tough De'Aaron nights. Mm-hmm. But I need Keegan Murray to be really aggressive. And I need Davion Mitchell to be really aggressive. And... I think everybody else will kind of fill into their spot. If you happen to get a good a good quarter or half from Trey Lyles, that's great. You know, maybe Sasha Vizenkov, who seems to kind of be on the outside of the rotation or kind of the fringe, he's the end of it. Like that first game he came back, coach didn't plan on playing him in that first half. They went to Kessler Edwards. I believe this was yeah. against Dallas, if I'm remembering that right. Mm-hmm. Um, coach went to Kessler Edwards except for one possession. He was He's like the reverse JTA is what we kept joking, right? He's coming yeah. in for one offensive possession. But then second half, didn't love what he saw with Kessler, so he ended up going to Sasha. I think we did see Sasha play in that Clippers game a little bit in uh, a bit as well, but he's kind of on the fringe. And then, you know, can Harrison give you something on a night? Can can Keon hit two, three threes? Because he's going to pull them, and he knows just as well as we do that he's going to be the guy that teams are okay living with. Mm -hmm. And so how does he respond to that? So I, I think there definitely are some interesting things to to kind of keep tabs on here. And the last thing um, that I wanted to mention, see if you have anything else here, but just got another update in the middle of this. Adrian Wojnarowski saying that. Uh, oh, what well, we got uh, previously, the Hornets had moved on from Steve Clifford at the end of the season is yeah. the plan that he's going to be moving into a front office role. And he had mentioned Woj that a couple people were, Candidates and Woj, another update today, day after, says the Hornets have secured permission to interview several assistants for franchise's head coaching op- opening. Denver's David Adelman, son of Rick Adelman, uh, yeah. legendary Kings coach. Sacramento's Jordy Fernandez, Boston's Charles Lee, and Phoenix's Kevin Young. More candidates are expected to be interviewed. Um, a comment got me. A comment got me. Says I was wondering Doc, what was going on after Doc Rivers is fired. Uh, yeah, he hired their next season. Yeah. Um, yeah, my bad. A comment got me while I was reading that, but it's kind of the typical names that you would expect. I think Charles Lee and um, Kevin Young are guys that Jordy was competing with also for other openings this offseason. I want to say the Toronto one that ended up going to um, Dark Over Djokovic, I believe is how you say that. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, and a couple other spots as well, but like, we'll see what else ends up becoming available this offseason. It's hard to imagine Jordy sticks around. I mean, you, you see it as much as I do, but like, Jordy seems so ridiculously well liked. I don't know how it became that he became the, or how it came to be that he's the Canadian head coach, 
that's a interesting thing to me with Jay Triano on the staff with Triano being like very proudly Canadian and uh, having coached that team before I gotta I should ask if there's some sort of connection there but every time a team comes into town there is a lot of staffers going up saying what's up to Jordy and having like full-on conversations not like a quick dap up you good all right see ya like Mm -hmm. Jordy seems extremely well liked and highly thought of in coaching circles like he it wouldn't surprise me if he's gone this offseason really and he deserves it he definitely does and it would almost surprise me if he is back next season i think at one point during the season you and i were chopping it up frankie included but i was like do y'all think he's gonna even be back next season and i think the consensus in that conversation was no yeah. and he like you said is just so well liked every single game He's having at least like a five to possibly 10 minute conversation with, if not one, a handful of other coaches on other teams. And even just on the bench, he's up sometimes more than Mike. I know he's kind of like the defensive coach at this point, but guys on the floor for the Kings are looking to Jordy for instructions often. And Mike has said during pressers a bunch of times that he's, He's just a relaxed person in general, Mike, but he's encouraged Jordy to be up and embarking out orders throughout the game. And it's almost like Mike sees the writing on the wall. He realizes Jordy probably won't be back. And so he's empowering him to be almost like a second head coach from time to time. And Jordy seems to really embrace it and love it. He has great people skills. He's, I mean, we're, we're at, a great amount of home games, but like we're even able to dap him up and pass and see how he's doing. So I think his relationship management is a huge factor and he's just a great guy by all accounts. So kudos to him for even being in the running and depending on who's coaching where next season and who steps down, who's fired this and that at the end of the season, like even if it's not in Charlotte, I would have a hard time seeing Jordy not being someone's head coach next year. I'm the same. We'll see how many openings there are because um, there's some other good candidates around the league too, but I think Jordy's right around the top of that list. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of Toronto people were sad that he didn't end up getting that, especially with the Team Canada connection. Um, yeah. Not that they're, you know, I think they're in an okay spot with their current head coach, but definitely has some fans up in Toronto and, and around the league in general. Um, so you know, brought that Denver defense to a point where they got pretty good with a roster that I didn't think was very talented on that end before they got Aaron Gordon. And the Sacramento team is turning around a little bit defensively as well. He's definitely their defensive coordinator. And like you mentioned, he's standing up just as much as maybe not just as much because Mike isn't literally never sitting down, but (laughs) he's up there all the time. Um, Very animated reactions. One of my favorite things to recommend to people is if you're trying to figure out if a play went the way it was supposed to go, just look at the coaching staff, right? Just look at the coaching staff's reaction. And typically you'll get a little something from Jordy after defense or Jay after offense. So there's little fun stuff there to, to tune into, I guess. Do you have anything else before I do a, we go to OT real quick. Last thing I'm really looking forward to the Boston game because it's, tomorrow at this point and we know the kings aren't necessarily the best team on the second night of a back-to-back then you factor in playing boston then you factor in playing in td garden against a boston team that won't be coming off of a back-to-back i think that will be a really good test for the kings and i want to see if they pass or fail absolutely same here. I'm hoping they don't get uh, absolutely smacked in Boston like always seems to be the case. I hate to be that guy, but I swear it is bad every yeah. time. And um, hopefully they have a little more added motivation because of how Boston smacked them when they were here at Golden 1. So, Yeah, and it's ridiculous to look at. I saw somebody say this the other day. So the R- Warriors, who are the 10 seed, right, are closer to the Minnesota Timberwolves, the one seed, than the Milwaukee Bucks, the two seed in the East, are to the one seed Celtics. What that, bro. the hell, dude? How are you 13 games up on the two seed? 
like, what are we talking about? If they don't, if they don't at least, well, the finals should be a given for Boston this it season. Should. And if they don't win, it's probably a really disgusting look at this point. Which is always such a shit spot to be in, to be honest. Well, okay, it it's a good spot to be in. But, but it's like, also a nasty good, though. Like, it is. Like, it, that's what everybody talks about, like, you know, never felt this, I will say. Uh, but just listen to, like, Draymond and Mark Cuban. He just had Mark Cuban on his pod, right? And they talked about the first time they both won, won a chip in obviously kind of different roles. But they, it wasn't necessarily this like excitement or holy shit it was like a relief mm. more than anything you know and i think that when you're on boston spot that's sort of it right either you're yeah. extremely disappointed or relieved rather than like happy as shit you know yeah. for lack of better words i'm sure there would still be some happiness there some feeling of accomplishment and stuff like that but it's a weird spot to be in for sure. And how are they going to close out this regular season? None of these games matter anymore. None yeah. of these games matter anymore for the last like 10 games of a season. I just saw uh, Amick, Sam Amick, your coworker, kind of friend of the show, I guess, said that, you know, this is a bigger gap than the Warriors had in their prime. Like, how do you handle the end of this season and still try to maintain some momentum going into the postseason is a interesting aspect here. But that's enough Sacramento Kings talk. We're headed to overtime. There we go. It's all right. It's all right. Okay. So totally pulling this one out of nothing. Um, what are your favorite? We'll go podcasts in general. I was going to say sports podcasts, but that's really all I listen to. Okay. Like that Braun and JJ one, the Mind the Game one that just came out, amazing. It is. That's the ultimate, like basketball nerd podcast, For which sure. obviously we both are. So I love that. Unrelated to basketball, there's these twin brothers from PG County in um, Maryland. Honestly. I'm geographically challenged, so it might be DC, it might be Maryland. Not not really sure there, but I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I, I know they're they're from the DMV, and they have just a, a really cool like lifestyle podcast where they talk about a lot of like different things going on in music. They were film majors, so they're really big on movies, and it's just a good like decompression podcast. You throw it on when you're cooking, which I don't do a ton of chores <laughs> around the house, which I do do. But um, outside of that, I'm I'm really, really into Podcast P, I think. Same. Yeah, he does a really good job of not just talking to Hoopers. So there was an interesting episode of, with Schoolboy Q, who just recently dropped a great album in Blue Lips. And he looks so he, different, by the way. Yeah, he's I think he's lost like a good amount of weight. He looks like he has, yeah. Yeah, and just hearing about guys who are, like, not even really hoop adjacent, but people who are interesting and also have interest in basketball. So you can talk about hoop a little bit, but you learn more about their life and what got them to this point. And I've been a fan of, of Paul George's pod since it first came out, but he seems to keep building on it. He's becoming a really great interviewer and – at the game the other night, it took a lot for me not to like hit him with like a love the podcast, great pod, bro. <laughs> like so, but I, I love what he's doing with that. Yeah, you know, if his co-hosts would have been there, maybe that's that's when you drop one of those. And yeah, I you for sure. Um, I, I think that that's a really important aspect of all these player pods is getting the right co-hosts. Like, mm -hmm. as part of why I love Pat Bev's pod is because I think his relationship with roan his co-host is yeah. great and that dude is clearly very comfortable with himself you know right. and you could tell that they're their boys are same with the the pg one like you could tell they mm -hmm. genuinely grew up together they had vince staples on a pod too yeah i was telling you the other day there's something i don't know i'm just saying your cadence is a little, Bro, a little I, vince staples <laughs> is all i'm saying i told um I told xavier this the other day and he's like oh i kind of see it I yeah see it. 
I never thought about that, but I love Vince, his music, him as a person. So I'll take that. There you go. Um, let's see what, uh, what other ones. I do kind of like the Draymond one. Draymond mm-hmm. and Pat Bev and Jeff T, those three, oh, and, yeah. and the All Smoke, literally mm-hmm. all three of those, I will monitor for, okay, did they get a guest I want to listen to? Mm-hmm. You know? And same with like the Gilbert Arenas one, actually. I find that one fun. It's not the most educational. It's right. fun, you know? Um, but those are probably the three. And then like Low Post is definitely one that I listen to damn near every episode. I think he does really well. I guess that's about it. And JJ's like actual pod, the old man in the three. I like as well. Um, I think that's it. I think you got some it. good ones in there though. Um, Club 520, Jeff Teague's, yeah. that's really good. I think the storytelling Jeff has is unmatched. He has. How does like, he remember all this shit, bro? Like, I don't know. I my memory is not nearly as good as that, and he's remembering like specific details that make shit way funnier. So, kudos to him. I think Draymond also. I, I really like his pod just because he's like himself every single time, and he's not sugarcoating anything. He's uh, just really authentic, and I appreciate that about him. Yeah, people definitely get on Draymond's ass, but I, yeah. I personally kind of enjoy Draymond. Same. And like you said, the authenticity, I think, is big there. You know, I think his last episode, he's talking about how, you know, people make a lot of his antics and things like that, obviously. But he's talking about, like, getting his kid and wife tickets courtside or not courtside, but tickets to the game pretty low every time he's like now i'm kind of thinking about this shit a little more because now my kid's watching me and kind of had that conversation with cuban and things like that so yeah. i think there's good conversations in there um yeah i think that's all i got i think there was something else i was going to throw out there but that might be it then um yeah i think it's going to do it that was a good one another great one in the books to me there we go well check out hunter's work at the athletic and at hunt patterson underscore on twitter you could find my work at sacktownsports.com and be sure to like subscribe and review helps a bunch with the algorithm if you're on the youtube side leave us comments and we're happy to take them for the next episode and appreciate everybody tuning in you'll hear from hunter and i in the next couple days